A couple of weeks ago in the Interpreting the Bible class, which is a class I like to have students dig deep uh, with tough passages, um, I asked the question, what do you do when you think Scripture might be wrong about something? And we had a nice discussion uh, based on that question. It wasn't long afterward that I thought, I better look and see what my passage is going to be for chapel coming up in a couple of weeks. And I looked, and next to my name was Luke 17. Now, this is what's sometimes called poetic justice. Uh, <laughs> because I admit, on first reading of this passage that you just heard, I find more things in it that are difficult than are easy. And, and it's not like some other scriptures where it's hard to understand. Um, I do understand this. I think that's the problem. Um, I'm afraid I don't agree with it. And let me explain my interpretive difficulties in case uh, it's not clear what they are or you share them. Uh, verse 5, I get. Lord, grant us faith. No problem there. But then that's followed by two kind of unconnected statements from Jesus. The first one is in verse 6 about transplanting this mulberry tree that doesn't agree with my theology or my experience. And then the uh, set of rhetorical questions, the second uh, statement here of Jesus. With each of those questions, I think I would answer in the way opposite to what he expects, which kind of defeats the purpose of the parable. Because I would invite my servant to come and sit and rest. I would invite my servant to the table to eat with me. I would say thank you to my servant. And then I would feel guilty for having a servant at all. <laughs> let, me, let me speak to the first difficulty. In, in Luke and in Luke volume 2, many extraordinary things happen as the result of prayer. The disciples are filled with the Holy Spirit. They're filled with boldness to go and preach. Tabitha is raised from the dead. Peter is released from prison, and so on. And not to put the following accounts on par with Luke and Acts, but the history of the church tells us about some extraordinary things happening as well. Healings, exorcisms, even a few cases of levitation. My knowledge of church history is not exhaustive, but I do not recall a mulberry tree or any tree, for that matter, being transplanted, uh, as, as the Bible here says, uprooted and planted in the sea as a result of a mere command. Maybe there's something out there, but um, that doesn't happen uh, a lot anyway. Yet we are told that even with minimal faith, this will happen. And, and not to be overlooked here, but I'm not sure why anyone would want to do that with a tree. So these are some of the difficulties I have uh, with verse 6. This saying is paralleled three times in Matthew and Mark. And each time it is actually a mountain that's being moved. So in comparison, uh, Luke replacing mountain with tree seems to have lowered the stakes a bit. And, and let me be blunt here, if I haven't been yet. Um, when I was reading Howard Marshall's commentary, which is one of the best on Luke in the English language, I think, I did not feel much enlightened. After two heavy pages of form and source criticism and Greek vocabulary, he actually uh, comes to the interpretation of verse 6, and he does it in one sentence. This is what he says about this saying and its parallels. Quote, The saying is not to be taken literally in any of its forms. End quote. Not particularly helpful. <laughs> I did not come to this passage with much insight. But unless I'm willing to say that no one in the history of the church has ever had faith the size of a mustard seed, and I'm not willing to say that, um, then of course the saying of Jesus, like so many others, is hyperbolic and figurative. But unlike some of those other hyperbolic sayings of Jesus, in this case, it's not immediately clear to me what the point is. Why, uh, what do the mountain and the mulberry tree represent? in these sayings. Why should we want to move either one of them? What does this saying actually mean for the life of faith? Well, in Matthew 17, verse 20, the saying about moving a mountain comes in the context of the disciples' inability to cast out a demon. 
They had been commissioned and empowered to do this. So Jesus describes their inability to do this as the lack of their own faith. Drastically changing the earth's topography with a word is a uniquely divine prerogative, and it's impossible for a human to accomplish uh, alone. But perhaps it's no more impossible than a human overpowering a demon. In the synoptics, demons represent opposition to the kingdom of God and the ministry of Christ, obstacles that must be overcome. To a weary traveler walking from one end of Israel to another and looking down the road, mountains represent obstacles on the journey. You must either walk around them or over them. There's no other choice. But what if you could just remove the mountain from that road? Well, trees get in the way too. <laughs> just over two years ago, uh, in September of 2011, Two giant sequoia trees in the Sierra Nevada fell uh, in what's called the uh, Trail of 100 Giants. I remember this, when this happened because my family had been to see the giant sequoia trees just about a month before that. Um, impressive uh, sight for sure. I'm not sure if they renamed it the Trail of 98 Giants, but uh, two of them fell literally on the trail. And it sparked a big debate about what to do with these trees. Um, do we just have people go around them? Well, that's, a, that's a, a long walk, adds a lot to the trail. Should we just leave them there and kind of let nature be? Or should we remove them? Which is also not a small task for two examples of the largest living species on Earth. Um, I think since then they've actually built a stairway and a bridge over the trees so that you still get the trail and you can see the trees from uh, a different angle. To give a more typical example, I mowed my yard on Saturday. And I could mow my yard in half the time if I didn't have so many trees and knickknacks in the way. Sometimes I would like, just like for them to be moved out of the way. Maybe, this is the best I can do with this passage, uh, friends. <laughs> Maybe this saying in its various forms is about removing obstacles to the work of God's kingdom. And as Jesus usually pointed down the road and said, you can move a mountain with just a little faith, um, maybe one day there was a mulberry tree in the way. The point is, large and small obstacles, whether it's a demon or a mountain or a mulberry tree. This mulberry tree is what Jesus says here, actually. The one that he was looking at while he was teaching on that day. The point is, trusting God to remove the obstacles can actually lead us to greater trust when facing the next obstacle. If we use the little faith that God has given us and trust Him, He will increase our faith. Now on to the second group of sayings. The difficulty here, I think, is mostly cleared up when we realize the cultural differences between the New Testament period and our own. Why wouldn't you eat with your servant. Why wouldn't you thank your servants for doing their job? Well, there are two difficulties here that we can blame on cultural distance. First, we tend to read into this text our modern sensibilities about um, egalitarianism, uh, employer-employee expectations. Why wouldn't one eat with the employees and thank them for a job well done? Even President Reed sometimes stoops to eat with us at lunch and even thanks us when we perform our task well. But in Luke 17 and in first century culture, these are not employees and these are not even servants. These are douloi, slaves. So maybe a modern illustration of the impropriety of this scenario would be going to a nice restaurant being shown your uh, seat, and then instead of being served, you insist that the waiter sit in your seat. Then you take his order, you get his drink and his food, and then you sit down to eat only after he's finished uh, eating. Would you do that? Now, it might be a nice gesture with a good intention, but it would be awkward, unnecessary, 
and potentially disruptive to his job. There are reasonable expectations for going into a restaurant and being served by the servers. So the point here is that no, a master wouldn't do that for his slave in the first century any more than we would go into a nice restaurant and proceed to switch roles with our server. Second, unlike the first century, in most centuries other than our own, we now live in a culture of reward and entitlement in which everyone is a winner, everyone receives a trophy, everyone is a hero, everyone is a star, and everyone exercises their individual rights, especially their right to take offense and their right to do whatever pleases them. The concept of duty, ought, obligation to someone or something else is a quaint idea of the past. Our cultural assumption is that we are bound to nothing but our own whims, yet we are entitled to recognition and reward. Perhaps this assumption had also infiltrated the first century. Is it our assumption too? And when we fail, or even when we do something wrong, we still display our sense of entitlement by shifting the blame or by making excuses. To the Pharisees, to the leaders in Theophilus' church, and to us, what Jesus says here is a hard word. And in this case, if we don't agree with Scripture, then we need to be changed. This is a hard word because it turns the culture's assumption of reward with no obligation on its head. Rather, we are bound to duty but with no claim to reward. And here Professor Marshall is much more helpful than before when he writes, the performance of duty does not entitle one to a reward. Let me repeat that. The performance of duty does not entitle one to a reward. I taught a class this morning. Should I get a Halloween bonus? <laughs> a Hershey bar? A thank you from the board? No, I'm a teacher. I've done my duty. A student comes to every class, finishes the readings, and turns in the paper on time. Should she get bonus points? A thank you note from the teacher? No, she has done her duty. We have obligations that, at least in these examples, we have freely taken on. When we fulfill these duties, we are simply keeping our word. Now, I'm not saying that thank yous are wrong between teachers and students. I'm definitely not saying it's wrong for the school to give me a Halloween bonus, <laughs> Thanksgiving, Christmas bonus, whatever. I'm not going to turn that down. I'm not saying it's wrong to reward your children for successes and for good behavior. Gratitude, incentives, rewards, positive reinforcement, doing things out of love and not just duty, they all have their place, and especially in the Christian life. But once we are obliged, or we have obliged ourselves to a course of action, then there is nothing supererogatory about following through that course. We shouldn't follow through on our word for the sake of extra reward. Because we don't put those whom we are obliged to serve in our debt when we simply serve them. Now the obvious point of this little parable of Jesus, though it's not explicitly stated in the text, is that just as a slave owes the fulfillment of commands to the master, we are in this same position before God our master. There is no obligation in your life or mine that supersedes our obligation to God. We have a charge. We have a duty. Not things, but one thing, verse 10 says. One goal, and that is to seek God. If the goal, if what we owe is to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, then there is no such thing as works of supererogation. 
There is no possibility for going above and beyond perfection. There is only falling short. There is hitting the bullseye and there is missing the mark. Again, just as it's right to reward our children or employees and so on, I'm not saying that God cannot or should not out of His abundant grace, grant rewards to His servants who have uh, selflessly sacrificed and, and made great sacrifices. But the point is that we should never serve God out of motivation for greater reward. And even more, we can never lay claim to God's favor or put God in our debt. God does not stand in need of our service when He commands us to fulfill duty. At best, we are unworthy slaves who have simply fulfilled our obligation. And that's if we hit the bullseye. But have we sinned? Ever? What about this past week? Yeah. We can't even do our duty without missing the mark. Unworthy slaves indeed. You know, about the last time in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus told His followers to say something was back in Luke 11. And the thing He wanted them to say was the Our Father, the Lord's Prayer. And we've done that here um, this morning. But here Jesus tells us to say something else. We are unworthy slaves. How's that for a liturgical response? <laughs> we are unworthy slaves. Well, I'm inserting it into the liturgy. Let's say those words together. We are unworthy slaves. God owes us nothing. And we owe God nothing less than everything. And maybe that's one of our obstacles, a sense of entitlement that says, I'm not as, I don't have as many vices as my neighbor. I'm not as bad as that person. God sure is lucky to have me on His team. May this sense of entitlement and any other mulberry tree that hinders our journey along the narrow path be uprooted from our lives and cast into the sea. May God replace it with a sense of gratitude. May we go forth from here and do our duty. But wait, alternate ending. I don't want to soften the hard word here. But, and homiletically I should. This is where the pericope stops. And if this is true, what I've said, it needs no addition to it, for sure. But I can't help going on because the Gospel of Luke doesn't end here, and the story of Scripture doesn't end here. No, God doesn't need to tell us, thank you. No, God, our Master, certainly doesn't have to invite us to His table. As the transcendent Creator, He has no inherent obligation to us. Dust He created from nothingness. We should say, unworthy slaves. We should never forget that truth. But at the same time, we serve a God who didn't have to, but freely has obliged Himself to us. A God who is the source of every good and perfect gift. We are obliged covenantally to a God who has gone to such great lengths, even moving mountains and mulberries, to save creatures who do nothing but miss the mark and still think, the worst of all, still think we deserve a reward for it. And yet, like a generous parent, He makes sure that we don't get what we deserve and that we do get from Him what we don't deserve. Unworthy slaves? Yes. Prodigal and lost not worthy to be called his sons and daughters. Yet he still runs to us to embrace us, to kiss us, and he adorns us with the best robe, a ring, and sandals for our feet. We say unworthy slaves, and before the words fully escape our mouths, God promptly interrupts, my sons and daughters. As the Gospel of Luke makes clear, this is a God who, throwing caution to the wind, indeed invites us slaves to sit down at His table, where He serves us, and eats with the most unworthy of us, to embrace us, to draw us into His eternal fellowship as friends.
even as sons and daughters. So I'll conclude again here for real. But now in light of the whole truth, that we serve a master who wants to be our father. Let us go forth from here and do our duty. Let us serve God as He deserves. May we give and not count the cost. And let us expect no reward save knowing that we do His will.